Turn to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. Anybody have a praise report? We could be here all day praising. So. Well, yeah, but God's giving praise. He says, "Come into His presence with praise." Sorry. I'm... <laughs> so Leviticus twenty. Now, one thing about this, guys, um, very similar. If you read it, very similar to Leviticus eighteen. Okay, if you if you read Leviticus twenty and you compare it to Leviticus eighteen, you're like, this is almost the same thing, and it is. We'll talk about that in a minute. I want to start out. Let's just read. The first five uh, verses of Leviticus 20, and we'll get into this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also say to the sons of Israel, Any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens sojourning in Israel who gives any of his offspring to Molech shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will also set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people, because he has given some of his offspring to Molech, so as to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. If the people of the land, however, should ever disregard that man when he gives any of his offsprings to Molech, so as not to put him to death, then I myself will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut off from among their people both him and all those who play the harlot after him by playing the harlot after Molech. Now, we talked about the worship of Molech two weeks ago. Somebody... Explain to me what that entails. What is the worship of Moloch? They sacrifice their children to it in fire. Is that what you want? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's good. Don't, don't second guess yourself. Is it good? So here is kind of a, a drawing of the picture of this iron s- statue with arms outstretched, fire burning in the middle of the belly. They would sacrifice their first son, beating drum, boom, 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 to try to cancel out that crying screams. And they did this, and I told you all two two weeks ago, I went to a spot where underneath the earth they found bones of little babies, tons of them. They did that because they thought they could get financial gain. They thought they could get God's blessings if they sacrificed their first newborn. Now, here's the thing I want you to see because because until I started studying this this week, I had never seen something that you will not get from an English translation. So you see in this, there's three times it says that a person gives his child to Moloch. Three times in these verses. Three times, give his child. The same word, the same word, it says when, when God says, if you give your child to Moloch, then I will give my, sorry. It says, I will set my face against that person, right? He says, if you give your child to Moloch three times, then I will set my face Against that person. The same word for give and set is the same word in Hebrew. Now, why does that matter? God's playing with language here. And if you're Hebrew, you get it. Because God's saying this. He's saying, if you give your child to Molech, then I'm going to give my personal attention. I'm going to turn my face and my wrath is coming on you. Just like you gave your child, I'm giving myself to you in my whole wrath. That's what God says. I'm not playing around. And when we read this, and we, if you're Hebrew and you're reading that, that, that thing jumps off the page. Okay? I say that as just a tidbit to encourage you. God's word is rich, rich, rich. And you can be satisfied with doing a quick five-minute devotion and reading and going on to the next thing, but there is so much packed in to God's word, especially in the original language. I just want to encourage you. You've heard this over and over. Beverly said it. I've said it. Bert said it. Don't be satisfied with a surface read because there is so much meat in God's Word. 
And if you don't know how to study God's Word and you want help, I'm telling you, I love it. Come see me. We will sit down and talk about what it looks like to <coughs> delve into some of the original language, how you do it. You think you have to be a scholar. No, you don't. I've taken that. You have to have the resources. You have to know what you're doing, but any of us can do it. Now, so let's, let's get back into 20. I, I just wanted to give that little commercial because and, and, we talked about that two weeks ago. Much of chapter 20, like I said, uh, or if you've read, it, it deals with improper sexual relations, just like 18, and just like I did in chapter 18. I'm going to rush right past some of that stuff. Uh, the difference between chapter 18 and chapter 20 is this. There is a completely different audience. There is a completely different audience. Leviticus 18 is address, addressing the, the offender, the person that may commit these sins, right? So the Israelite... It's basically saying you don't do that with your sister, right? Or you don't. It's addressing the would-be offender. Chapter 20 is more on, okay, Israel, if someone does it, this is the punishment. Okay, so it's basically more of this is how you handle the offender if they do these things. That's the difference, okay? Now, with our discussion in Leviticus 18, we saw that there was a common punishment for uh, certain offenses. Do you remember what that punishment was? Over and over we saw it in Leviticus 18. That person shall be... What, what do we say that they are to do? They are set apart, but if they committed those sins, they were going to be put to death. Stoning. Stoning. Now, you see that by the way, in verses 2, 9, 10, 12, 14, 15, and 16 of Leviticus 20. Over and over, God says, stop right here on this chapter because the punishment, if you don't get this stuff right, is death. So do you think, again, be a Jew for just a second, do you think you would stop at this chapter and get this stuff down if you're teaching your children? The punishment is death. Over and over and over. Now, here's what is interesting. What types of crimes does God demand death for? The strongest punishment, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, we're going to see more times as we keep going, is if you don't worship God correctly, if you're not worshiping Him, you're worshiping idols, or family, then the punishment is death. Now, let me tell you how countercultural that is. At the time, every other community besides Israel, their strongest punishment, their death penalty, had nothing to do with family relations, had nothing to do with if you didn't worship God correctly. It was all driven by money. If you did the wrong things financially, the punishment was death. And God says, that's not my standard. The things I'm most serious about are you worshiping me as, my, as your Lord and you getting family relationships right? Can you imagine living in a culture where there's more emphasis placed on material possessions than life? That's what Israel was running into. And I would argue that's what we run into. Now, what I want to spend some time on, Leviticus 20, chapters, uh, verses 22 to 24, I, I want to I tease this in my email, my, my text yesterday. Read with me, verse 22. You are therefore to keep all my statutes and all my ordinate, ordinances and do them, so that the land to which I am bringing you to live will not spew you out. We talked about that last week, that the land vomits them out, right? We talked about that. 23. Moreover, you shall not follow the customs of the nations which I will drive out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I have abhorred them. Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. Milk and honey. First off, it says you're to keep all my statutes. Remember that word? We, we talked about this the last couple weeks. 
is to proactively guard offensive and defensive measures. What I tell you to do, don't just be on the defensive as a Christian. Don't just, oh, something's coming. Let me, let me be on the defensive. No, he says, proactively guard everything I've told you to do. And that means sometimes you have to be on the offensive. Now, then it talks about how Israel is possessing the promised land. How does he describe the promised land? Okay. A land flowing with milk and honey. Now, what do you see when God says the promised land is going to be flowing with milk and honey? What do you see in your mind? Lots and lots of animals and green grass. And... Lush, beautiful fields and animals lots and all of kinds of just eat. all kinds of food to eat. Okay, perfect. Okay. Now, <laughs> in the Middle East, let me just tell you, that's not the image. Okay? That's not the image. Milk is a product of the shepherd. Okay? Milk is the product of a shepherd. They produce milk by their flocks. Don't have a lot of cows in Israel, so what? What's the source of the milk? Goat. Goats. Exactly. Goat milk. Okay? So, honey, to a Middle Easterner, is the product of the farmer. So you have the shepherds produce milk, the farmer produces honey. Now, honey may not be exactly what you think it is. Here's the thing. There's two types of honey, and they're both mentioned in the Bible. Two types of honey. You have the bee honey. That's the kind we're used to, right? You got the little... Uh, you got some at home, I'm sure, a little teddy bear looking thing and all that good stuff. That's, that, that's our honey, right? And yes, they have that. There are texts in here that talks about bee honey. But there's another type of honey from figs and dates and fruits, okay? It's more like jam to us. When I go to Israel, one thing I can bring back to you if you like this sort of thing is their honey. They call it devash, okay? It is jam, it's not bee honey. It's made from figs. It's made from, from, from fruit, okay? That is devash. Now, both words are devash. So in the Bible, when it says honey, it's just devash. Whether it's bee honey or jam honey, it's devash, okay? It's the same word. D-E-V-A-S-H. D-E-V-A-S-H. Devash. Now, Deuteronomy 8, 7 through 9, okay? God lists seven things that you will see in the promised land. Seven types of food, okay? Here, here's what he says. He says, uh, wheat, barley, vines, which are grapes, figs, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. Don't get bogged down. Don't try to memorize that, okay? You can turn there yourself. It's, it's Deuteronomy 8, verses 7 through 9. All of those are plant-based, except for what we think about as honey. Why would God put six things plant-based and say, oh, by the way, yeah, there'll be a lot of bees too, and you're going to have honey? Well, here's the thing. That the picture that you see, and this is all throughout Jewish literature too, they say it is not bee honey. I mean, even from the time of Jesus, they said that is not bee. So much so, another story for another day. Let me let me stay on track. Okay, now the honey there is jam, devash. Okay, devash. So honey is a product of the farmer. The farmer produces honey, and the shepherds produce the milk, land flowing of milk and honey. Now, another place you see milk and honey, by the way, is Isaiah 7. This brings it out more clearly when I say that it's not bee honey, okay? This brings it out more clearly for those of you that want to see why I say that. Isaiah says that the king of Assyria will turn the land into a land of milk instead of a land of milk and honey. That's what it says in Isaiah 7. And it meant that he would kill the farm so much, the only thing you could do in Israel after that if he did it was you could pasture flocks. There's no farmland. You don't turn to me, I'm going to bring them in, the king of Assyria, and your farms are going to be wiped out. The only, thing you can, the only thing your place will be good for is to have shepherds. And it says that because he says in that Isaiah 7 that there used to be a thousand vines that will become briars and thorns. And those spots will be overtaken by oxen and sheep. He's saying, all that honey that was produced, there's no farmer anymore. Shepherds will take over. I'm telling you, there's places in Israel where right beside each other, 
Shepherd lives here, not a mile away. Farmer lives here. And God says, that is the picture of what I'm... And and that is very unusual for the Middle East. Almost every other culture at the time, you either were a land of shepherds or a land of farmers. And God says, I'm going to give it all to you. So we in our mind think, oh man, it's going to be flowing with just all this awesome stuff. Guys, when they got there, it was so much desert. 70% of Israel is desert. And they grumble and they complain. And and it's amazing. Well, why would God say it's a land flowing with milk and honey? And then in the Bible, you see them getting there and there's so much desert. It's because it's not the picture you think about. It's where the shepherd and the farmer can live together. Now, it's a powerful image, and here's why I think it's so powerful. In the Bible, who says that he is our shepherd? Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own. In the Bible, who says that he is the farmer, and we are the vine? Isaiah 5, 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. It's this picture that God uses over and over. John 15, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Over and over you see this picture of God saying, I am the one you're supposed to turn to. I'm the shepherd, and I'm the vine, and I'm going to give you a land where both can exist at the same time. Because I'm both. I'm the shepherd, I'm the farmer. Now, here's the other part of this. If you keep going in that Deuteronomy 8 passage that we talked about those seven different things in the promised land, I want you to listen to these words right after it. Listen to these words starting in verse 10. Okay, listen. When you have eaten eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant with which he swore to your fathers as it is to to this day. Here's the thing, guys. When you are blessed with a land flowing with milk and honey, and God says, here, it's yours. By the way, and don't forget about the one that gave it to you. We live in a land, yes, that is flowing with milk and honey. And it's not because there's green grass. It's not because there's, yes, all those are blessings. Don't get me wrong. But God says, I'm here with you. I'm your shepherd. I'm your farmer. And he says, where I've placed you, I have given you milk and honey. Because you have me. And it's easy to live here in America and feel like we have everything at our fingertips and not need him. Don't, he says, do not get there to the land flowing with milk and honey and forget about me. I'm the one that supplied it. I'm the one that's your good shepherd. I'm the one that's your farmer. You be my sheep. Sheep hear my voice. They know when I'm talking. And as I'm leading them, they they follow. You be my vines that produce the fruits I tell you to produce, not your own fruit. You be what I've told you to be. Don't forget about the shepherd and the farmer. Now, I want to spend the rest of our time looking at one other thing in this chapter. I just I have to get here. I have golf clubs up here. You probably saw them and thought, all right, what are we doing today? Verse 26. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. This may seem a little odd to you if you're not a golfer. I've spent a lot of time with my golf clubs over the years, and I love them. I do, okay? Um, I, I spent a lot of time with them. I have spent hours and hours at the driving range learning what to do. By the way, 
had this one for 22 years. Same with my putter. Some of these other ones are a little newer. I don't know when I got the driver. That was, I don't know. Yeah, it was. My newest uh, little thing was a few years ago was this little hybrid. There for a while I was thinking, I'm too young to hit a hybrid, right? If you call, used to be you had like a three wood and a five wood, and some of you don't care, Tommy knows what I'm talking about, but, but uh, <laughs> this is kind of replaces irons. And I was like, no, oh, I can hit a three iron or a four iron. Why do I need a hybrid? Yet this one is a really good club. Do you have hybrids? They're nice. They're nice. They're a lot easier to hit than long iron. I know you don't care, but I'm telling you anyway. I'm not gonna do now, what I'm telling you, I can't hardly get it back home. What, what I'm telling you is this. I have spent a lot of time, and I, I went to the driving range. I would, I would go after school in high school, and I would spend the rest of the day until it got dark. And then in the summer, it was like free game all day long. I was at the golf course. I'd go to the driving range. We had a driving range down from where I, where I grew up in McKenzie, and uh, I'd go there, and they had lights. So, and I would just practice, right? I'd, I'd just practice all different clubs. And here's the other thing I would practice. Let's say I have 100 yards, but there is a tree in front of me. Well, how can I get the ball higher? Or let's say there's a tree in front of me, and I need to keep it lower. How do I... And what's the distance when I... I tell you that to say, if you, if you don't play golf, if you don't understand what all's involved... Um, Tommy just grips it and rips it, right? He didn't care. I, I, spent, I spent a lot of time trying to perfect, okay, how far do I hit each club? When do I? Now, here, here's my point, okay? Here's my point. The reason why I like these golf clubs so much, and I would choose them over anybody else's, Tommy, I, you may have some that are even nicer, but I want mine because I know them. These are my clubs. I love them. I've used them a ton. They are mine, right? They are mine. I chose each one specifically for my swing, and, and, and I know how they come off the club face. I know that my driver is going to stay kind of low, so get out of the way if you're in front of me. But um, I know what they're going to do. But here's the thing. Do you understand? These are all very different clubs, but they have the exact same goal. What's the goal in golf? We're trying to get the little white thing in the hole, right? We're trying to get the ball in the hole. Therefore, if I'm 100 yards out, I'm probably not going to use a three iron. And if I'm 300 yards out, I'm probably going to not use my putter, right? Every, every club is designed for a specific need. There's this age-old question that all of us have heard and you may have asked. What is the purpose of life? Let me give you one scripture. Isaiah 43, 7. Isaiah 43, 7. Here's what it says. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even who I have made. And God says, I formed each person for a reason, and it's for my glory. What's the purpose of life? You cannot answer that question apart from the God of the universe. That he created me and you for a specific pur purpose and all of us for his glory. 100%, we are for his glory. Your life is to glorify your heavenly father. But here's the thing that I want you to see in this verse in, Levitic this, this verse in Leviticus. You are to be holy to me. Not you are to be holy, you're not just set apart, you're set apart to God. Big difference, to Him. Yes, you are to be different, but why to Him? See, your holiness, your set apartness is not for your sake. It has nothing to do with you. God says, I, I set you apart for me, for my purposes, for my glory, to be mine. And the purpose of our life is to point others to him. So why, I'm talking to me now, why do I make this life so much about me? You been there? Where you look back and so much of your time, so much of your energy, so much of your money is for you and not 
to the God who created you that says your purpose for everything I've given you, whether it's money, whether it's energy, whether it's time, is to glorify me. How come when I look back, so much of my time and my energy and my money has been for my benefit? Have I really been holy to him for his glory? So in the very same way these golf clubs have this overall purpose of executing my will as their owner. Don't miss that. Their purpose is to execute my will. I can do whatever I want to with any of these. They're mine. Some of them have been beaten up, hitting roots and whatnot. But they don't have a say in that. They're mine. And I use them how I see fit. And God says, all of you have a purpose too. But it's always to execute my will. It sounds a lot like Romans 12. Listen to Romans 12. Just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one, another, members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each one is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service, in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. God chose me. God chose you. God knows each of us. He knows us. He created us. And he says, I want you to know your strengths and you to use those strengths to glorify me. Now, we did a study last November, some of you have this, about there are 19 spiritual gifts in Scripture. And here's the little chart I made up of the different spiritual gifts, where they're found, what their purpose is, and what the dangers are. You probably remember, most of you probably remember that, right? We're not going to revisit all that. You remember we broke up into groups that morning and we all kind of talked to each other about what's your gifts, what's your gifts. Because I believe it is absolutely vital for each of us to know your gifts. How can you be busy using them if you don't know them? And I would tell you this morning, I will tell you this morning, if you don't know your gifts, you need to find it out. And I want you to think about it like this. Your gift is... is golf club in God's back. It's a golf club. Now, it's used for a specific purpose. Not all of them are the same, but it has, it has something that it's good at, right? Sometimes you have, I said a minute ago, I went to the driving range and I practiced and practiced and practiced. I'm telling you, I didn't just buy these golf clubs and they just hit themselves and it's like, woo. Going to the PGA Tour. It doesn't happen like that. It takes hours and hours and hours of practice. How much have you practiced, put into practice, the spiritual gifts God gives you? It's not like perfected as soon as you get it. When, like, when you're saved and God gives you, here, here's your gift or gifts. It's not like, oh, wow. I've told you all before, I mean... The ones that God has given me, it has taken a long time over years to develop. How much are you practicing your gifts? And here's a couple words of caution. First, I said a minute ago, I take this very seriously. Don't guess at your gift or gifts. If you don't know what your gift or gifts are, talk to me, talk to somebody, because you need to know. You need to know. We can point you in the right direction if, if, if we need to. So first off, don't guess. But one other word of caution. I was talking to Bert about spiritual gifts the other day just because um, he was asking what we were talking about and I was telling him some of the things. One other word of caution is this. It's tempting to say, for instance... My, my, one of my gifts uh, is, is teaching. I love to teach. I have a passion. I mean, I, I look forward to this all week long. Like, I'm, I'm counting down the hour for Sunday morning because I just can't wait, right? Some of you, if you were up here, wouldn't be the same type of result. You, you wouldn't be counting down. You're like, oh, my goodness, i got to teach in an hour. You know, I mean, it, you would not be looking forward to this, right? That's just not what God placed in you. 
But, but here's my word of caution. Just because he, he, he gives you a strength doesn't mean that all the other gifts can be put out the back. Does that make sense? See, here's the thing. There are times God puts us in positions where he, he doesn't want us to be strong in it so that the world can see that his strength is the one that's applying the power. Like this morning, if Bud, sorry Bud, calling you out, but let's say all of a sudden Brother Burke goes down, he can't talk, and he just points to Bud, and Bud gets up and he gives this 40-minute amazing spirit-filled sermon, would, you be, would your socks be knocked off? I would, because that's not his natural thing. I mean, it's not something that he just lives for, I don't think. Is it Bud? You can correct me if I'm wrong. But, but sometimes God says, I'm going to do something through somebody that that's not their strength so the world can see it's me doing it through them. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 talks about God's power being perfected in weakness. How can it be perfected in weakness if you're not sometimes put in spots where it's not your strength? And God says, in this weak area, I'm going to show the world my strength because I'm going to give you my power. Here's the thing. Just because my gift may not be giving doesn't mean I'm not to give. Just because my gift may not be mercy doesn't mean I'm not to be merciful. Just because my gift is not um, helps doesn't mean I'm, I'm supposed to say, uh, Julie, sorry, your gift is serving. That's not my gift. I'm going to sit on the couch. I'm going to watch TV. Don't say a word. <laughs> you serve. That's not my gift. That's not my gift. <clears throat> Just because my gift is not evangelism doesn't mean you are not to evangelize. Just because my gift is not uh, teaching doesn't mean you are never to teach. Julie brought up a good point one day. She said, if you're, if you're a, a, a parent, you can't say, I'm not going to teach my kids anything. That's not my gift. Go to school. Go to church. They'll teach you. That's what they're gifted at. No. As a parent, you teach. And as a Christian, all these things are gifts of flowing out of the Holy Spirit. And God says, I'm going to give you an extra special portion of one, two, three of them. That doesn't mean He's not going to give you some of the others if you're saved. You cannot say, that's not my gift, not my problem. Yes, we all have certain strengths, but there are times, this is, this is why you listen to the voice of your shepherd. Because there are times He's going to put you in positions that it's not your strength. And He says, I want to show the world my strength. And if it's your gifting... The world can look at you and say, yeah, but he's good at that. Yeah, that's him doing it. That's not God. Know your gifts. Know that God expects you to use them, but also be sensitive because he may put you in positions that it may not be your strength, but he wants to use you there anyway. So as we finish, I just want you to think one last time about these beautiful golf clubs of mine that I love so dearly. They don't get to tell me when they're used, how they use, where they're used. They, I use them as they see, as I see fit. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. Do you understand that you don't get to tell God how to use you? It may be that He calls you to go to Peru, and it's not a convenient time, and it's not a convenient. When God calls you, our job is to say yes, sir. Because our job is not to tell the master how to use us. And sometimes it may be in spots that we're weak. So don't automatically assume the answer should be no when you're asked about something. Because God may be saying, I want you to do it so that the world can see me through you. Are you living a life that is dead to you? 100% dead that the master can put in his hands and use how he sees fit. God, I, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you so much for this crew, God. Help us to truly, God, be yours. Help us die to ourselves every second of every day. Help us hear your voice as your sheep. 
Help us not be so focused on the world that we miss you. But God, help us to do what you tell us to do. And I pray that you, you will be glorified through each of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.